Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 451. That's 451 of the Agassino Zynga show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Good to know. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. You know what to do. Make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. That'd be much appreciated if you're listening via the podcast app. A little share and a five-star review will go a long way to help spread the show. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, you can via patreon.com forward slash agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O to support the show for as little as $1 and get a bonus episode free, bonus episode via Patreon only. If you subscribe via patreon.com for just A G O S T I N H O, get involved in it today. Don't delay. What are you doing? How's it going? How's it going? It's been an eventful, an eventful 48 hours or so for football fans all around the world. I think um, it, it does, it does really, <laughs> it does really bode well, you know, to see fans all over the world kind of gathering and basically bringing an end to this diabolical European Super League that they were trying to implement. And it's been great to see the backlash, really. It's been a little bit, you know, and what's I think called? It's been a little bit bittersweet for myself being a Manchester United fan, seeing some of our ex-pros who were, you know, um, disastrously silent throughout the entire Glazer occupation of the club and through, you know, Edward Wood's malpractice of running the Man United team overall and our business and our transfer to see them now suddenly, you know, get the courage to speak up is a little bit bittersweet, but it's good to see regardless. But yeah, what an amazing 48 hours. Um, it's really definitely kind of restored my, not restored, but it's definitely made me kind of question my idea that protest sometimes and outrage and mobilization online doesn't work. It does have a lot of impact. I think if we didn't have this collective anger and discuss towards the European Super League they definitely would have gone through I think the money that was already lined up the sponsorships and you know the earning potential would have just made it worth it for them to kind of you know be able to endure a lot of the hate and just kind of get over it which I'm kind of surprised I, I really did think they'd kind of hold out a little bit longer but I think the overall collective kind of like rejection of it and maybe more so with the players too because there's a lot of players behind the scenes that were really worried that it would affect their ability to play international football and all this kind of stuff and I think what we under I think what they might have underestimated these people that were trying to put this European Super League together they maybe underestimated what most football players are in it for right if you don't play for some of the biggest clubs in the world then you do get a lot of satisfaction just from playing the game right and competing against other players in other leagues and then testing yourself sometimes internationally if you get the privilege to represent your country um it's not always about playing like the biggest and glitziest clubs in the world because you know not everybody has the ability of a Messi or Ronaldo to play for these kind of clubs so you're gonna have to just you know take what you're given at that stage in some well at some stage in your career unless you have the you know the good fortune of ending up at a brilliant club somewhere but not everyone has that benefit so I think they may be underestimated um what football players are in it for and then of course they overly underestimated what football fans want to see week in week out because as much as you know you i think was it florentino perez or one of those people the other day he was had an interview where he said something like oh they kind of gave the idea that it felt like they were trying to do this european super league to cater to the younger audience that's what it basically felt like they were trying to compete um to get their eyes and attention and i think they regarded fans like myself as legacy fans basically fans are on the way out we weren't necessarily gonna buy more merch we weren't gonna you know purchase in-app stuff and whatever it may be called so and now maybe the the ability for them to squeeze more money out of us in our lifetime was basically diminishing as the years go by but with these kind of new digital native kids the only potential is kind of you know is limitless right and there's more of them right just you know simple maths or whatever it may be but i really question whether or not those fans are fans you can really build an entire league on like in the long term but again, maybe COVID really showed them that they could possibly do that because with COVID and no one going to actual football stadiums, you know, in person, it basically deemed, it basically then kind of, um, what well, it kind of basically reduced all football fans to streaming fans, right? We all turned into the same person, whether we were illegally streaming or legally streaming, we we're all the same people just watching it via our laptops or our smartphones or whatever it may be. So maybe those numbers just made too much sense to them. But I just can't believe that they had the guts and the gumption to do it without any consultation with the fans none zero and then they were surprised at the reaction it's just like what 
and it was so selfish as well it wasn't it was so self-serving it only was going to be beneficial to the owners of the clubs let's not get it confused this wouldn't have even if you were a team in england that were you know selected to be part of this group don't be confused that money wouldn't have gone to transfer fees that money wouldn't have gone to allowing your club to you know um refurb your stadium it wouldn't have gone to maybe you know um kind of redoing your youth team setup that wouldn't have gone to that that money would have gone directly in the pockets of the owners especially the glazers who currently are the you know custodians of manchester united they wouldn't have done anything to reinvest into the squad and to make it better they wouldn't have gone and got the world's best coaches and the world's best players in order to compete in the world's best league they wouldn't have done that they would have just you know skirted by doing the bare minimum because again there's no need to for to aim for excellence when there's no relegation and you know you get guaranteed money you're basically rewarding mediocrity and you're basically you know allowing these clubs to um uh, what you call it allowing these clubs to take advantage of a legacy that they've not helped to maintain in any way shape or form in the modern era absolute heinous heinous in all ways in all ways and don't get me wrong maybe there is an element of this is going to be inevitable there's going to be uh, a time in in the future where these clubs will eventually get the you know their ducks in order hire a proper pr team and consult fans and do something that's similar to a big six or to sorry to a, a super league um in some way shape or form because you know they definitely feel like they don't have the they don't have enough money they want more they definitely feel like they could kind of maybe generate more money on their own platforms tv rights all that sort of stuff cool but there's a way to do it it definitely is a way to do it that's not going to negatively affect the leagues all over the world because as it would have this would have had a knock-on effect in every single league in the world it would have just made it terrible and it's interesting too how much how little kind of regard european fans have for like the american league structure right and how they kind of structure teams and franchises and not having relegations we just don't get it whatsoever and they don't get it i think someone one of those sky news guys said something like he had a quote from one of the board members of one of the top six clubs who just couldn't get it around his head he couldn't get his head around the idea of relegation it just didn't make sense to him why do teams get relegated why do you get punished for not doing well in a league and then get rewarded for doing well in the, in the league below like it didn't make any sense to him like the teams are the teams isn't it they were the legacy teams they're the legacy teams there's no changing um it just didn't make sense and in the uk we just can't get around the idea of playing in the league or supporting a club in a league where no one gets relegated well what are the stakes so if, if, essentially if you are what if you are watching or following a team in an in in nfl you follow them for what reason so that they can win their region so that they can win the super bowl which is what you know through how many teams are going to be in there it's just it's a nonsense um sporting spectacle to kind of take maybe which makes sense why a lot of them are so much into stats and stuff because you know if you've got no trophies to win in the season you might as well just get obsessive about stats and you know um players and scouting younger teams and watching college football and so that's why probably they obsess all that kind of stuff because it's just it make that probably makes the sport a little bit more fun but if you don't have the ability you know the drama of maybe beating a top six club and maybe taking them off their perch and not allowing them to win the league and then that allows you to then survive if that drama doesn't exist then the only way to supplement it is to follow you know college level competition and you know over analyze statistics on players and stuff and follow them throughout the entire career and stuff that's the only way that makes sense crazy isn't it? absolutely crazy but this is the article confirming it um let's see if i can get it up on here let me get rid of this first Shh. So this is from Sky Sports. It says the following. Um, let's get it up on here. Move it a bit. Bo -bo 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 -bo. Bear with me. Mm, there we go. So this is from Sky Sports. It says the following. Uh, victory for fans as all six English teams pull out of European Super League. Um, all English teams have now pulled out the European Super League and I got a picture here of the Chelsea fans protesting outside the stadium as they were facing Brighton, I think. One was it one one or nil nil, I'm not too sure. But they basically blocked off the road and prevented the team bus from getting to the um to the stadium, which was great to see. Peter Cech had to come out and kind of, you know, talk them down a bit, but that was cool. Um Manchester United, Arsenal, Liverpool, Arsenal and Tottenham have confirmed that they will not follow through they'll not follow Chelsea and Manchester they'll follow Chelsea and Manchester City sorry and withdrawing from the planned tournament United said we will not be participating in European Super League just imagine the gumption that Arsenal and Tottenham had to be part of the European Super League they would have just been getting spanked every single season right every single season 
and just be pocketing money that they wouldn't have spent on the players like just heinous these these owners and absolutely heinous it continues Chelsea faced um with an angry protest from their fans was first in saying it, it was preparing the documents to formally withdraw um with the club owner Roman Abramovich understood to have driven the decision having listened to the fan protest and opted to back out crazy Tottenham chairman Damian Levy said he regretted the anxiety and upset calls and confirmed the club had formally comment um some commenced procedure to withdraw from the group developing proposal for the European Super league the daniel levy one is very interesting right if you believe the rumors supposedly he got rid of jose Mourinho, which is crazy to think right jose Mourinho got sacked from tottenham and no one's even talking about it this european super league just completely dominated the headlines i'm sure Mourinho is probably not feeling too happy about that himself right that he's not in the papers and getting a chance to kind of you know throw his little darts back at tottenham or whatever because he's definitely going to end up doing that but if you believe the rumors allegedly daniel levy got rid of jose Mourinho. this weird timing now because you know they're about to play a cup final i think on the weekend the caribou cup final the first chance to win a trophy in you know many many years but Jose Mourinho got fired because allegedly Daniel Levy was banking on that money coming through from the ESL to help pay for Mourinho's severance package because of supposedly he's getting up to 30 million because he's obviously getting sacked before his contract ends um and now that league is gone he's probably got to shell out money from the club's resources or his own pocket so it's crazy but then on the other end there's a voice note going around allegedly of Jamie Redknapp from whatsapp where he allegedly says the reason why Mourinho was sacked now was because they were outside the top six and he has some sort of clause in his contract basically meant if if they're not in the top six by a certain date within a certain window range date range um that he can half the severance package or so it, wherever if it was so if it was 30 million he only, he only has to pay him only 15 million so that might have been the reason why he decided to kind of you know um go for it now before things got too bad or before he actually got top four but they were still playing shit football so that or even going in range and he would still have to pay him 30 million regardless of what it was the irony is not lost on me that Mourinho accused Wenger of being a oh, what's that thing called a uh, what do you call him he called Wenger a specialist in failure but it looks like Mourinho is a specialist in failure right he's been able to secure what was it over 90 million 90 over 90 million pounds in severance packages so far from the clubs he's been fired from insane it continues um liverpool said liverpool football club can confirm that our involvement in the proposed plans to form the european super league has been discontinued in recent days the club has received representation from various key stakeholders both internally and externally and we would like to thank oh uh, god let's get those things off my thing oh it's annoying isn't it and we would like to thank um uh, duh, duh, duh. in recent days Cup has received reputation from various stakeholders in both Italian, and we'd like to thank them for their value contribution it's annoying when you get called things like stakeholders and shit and it just uh, whatever meanwhile Arsenal admitted that making a mistake and apologised after confirming their withdrawal so Arsenal I think the only one to actually apologise I think maybe Liverpool as well um, formally to their fans right um, you didn't get that from the Glazers which is understandable because they're pieces of shit it continues an open letter from the club board said last few days have been shown yet again the depth of feeling from our supporters around the world having um, have for the great club and the game we love we need to remind we need no reminding of this but the response from the supporters in recent days has given us time to further reflection and deep thought Man City said in a statement they had enacted the procedures to withdraw from the group developing plans for a European Super League City player Remin Sterling reacted to a news by tweeting okay bye manager Pep Guardiola had previously criticised the plans for the close shop league as fans from other clubs gathered outside stadiums up and down the country UEFA yeah, President Alexander Serafin said that he was delighted to welcome City back to the European um, football family they have shown great intelligence and in listening to the many voices, most notably their fans, and they have spelled out the vital benefits that our current system have for the whole European football, from the war beating Champions League final right down to a young player's first coaching session at the grassroots club, he wrote. And the FA said the English clubs has proud um, has a proud history. English football sorry, has a proud history based on the opportunity for all clubs and the game has been unanimous in its disapproval for the closed leagues. It's a position that by design could have divided our game, but instead it has unified us all for sure so definitely a good thing overall isn't it definitely a good thing that this thing has been stopped in its tracks and now we can kind of get back to regular scheduled programming but that wasn't it that wasn't the only news that came about from this in it another weird circumstance another weird twist in this whole affair this is definitely the strangest of times we're living in ed woodward has resigned as ceo of 
um, Manchester United, Manchester United exec or executives, whatever, executive vice chairman, right? He's resigned, Ed Woodward, one of the most um, reprehensible, probably I would say most hated figure at United, considering how little he knows about the game and how kind of sure he is of his own ability and his horrendous track record in hiring managers, constructing a team, um, you know, p putting the infrastructure around the club to in order to be successful, just a complete and utter waste of space, a weasel in all ways, shape or form, has resigned. And this is somebody you would have thought would have been happy to have cut, can continued, you know, cashing in a salary doing for doing absolutely nothing and being very bad at his job. And he's resigned the pressure from this ESL protest and the backlash that's come from it was just too much for him to handle. And he resigned. Absolutely insane. I would have never guessed it. I really wouldn't have guessed it. This wouldn't have been an outcome that I would have ever assumed would have happened. And now there's even rumors that the Glazers might be open to selling the club, which is something a bit far fetched. I still think the Glazers are too bloodthirsty and, you know, have too much cold blood running through their bodies in order to kind of give up a cash cow like United. They don't have to invest that much into the club. They've got a manager, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who is quite ordinary, but has basically been able to prove that he can achieve top four football for consecutive seasons. And he, you know, uh, uh, despite a catastrophic failure, it's probably going to happen again next season. So they, you know, they've basically got a guaranteed income in the Champions League. They're going to maybe be always there and thereabouts in the league continually. So I don't really see them ever letting their little dirty fingers off of the, you know, Man United ownership. I don't see it happening. But, there's rumours around it circulating and if Edward could resign then there is obviously still an opportunity for the Glazers to go as well because that would definitely be a new dawn a dawning of a new age for United there's a protest I think planned this weekend as well Glazers out protest but that would definitely be the dawning of a new age because I think everybody is aware especially most of the top six clubs that are owned by foreign investors we just need to get them out of football especially the ones that have no interest in making their teams the best in the world it's just not conducive to what we want to do but it's also very clear to us United fans as much as we've seen managers come and go who've basically been not very, not very much up to the job and we've maybe had a very odd mix of players um, and no real clear direction what we want to do going forward as a club what we can't deny is that our ownership has definitely held us back in you know from getting back to the heights of our glory days under, under SAF we don't really have owners who really want us to be the best in the world we have owners who want to basically extract as much value as they can at the club but not in order to achieve sporting greatness and without new ownership and new direction we're just going to be hoping winging and a prayer that we have a manager and a team that can just combine to win us things you know on any given moment that's the only way that's going to happen it's not going to happen because of a concerted effort from the board to kind of put together a world-class team and approach and a plan in order to get us back to the top it's just going to come from just winging it on the day right um kind of thing so this is from sky sports said edward Manchester united executive vice chairman to step down flipping insane may not as vice chairman it would have stepped to step down from his role. The club confirmed. However, he will continue in his role in the club until the end of 2021. I don't know why. Just go now already. We hate you. It continues. Woodward has already agreed with the Glazers, United owners, that he would finish the Old Trafford at the end of the year. But the announcement was brought forward to Tuesday evening, of course, due to the backlash of the ESL. The news comes after uh, Chelsea and Manchester City announced that they had decided to leave the breakaway Super League following the mass rejection of the plans by fans and the governing bodies across Europe later on Tuesday evening. Manchester United, Liverpool, Chelsea and Spurs have said they would draw two. Woodward said, I will treasure my time at United. We won't treasure your time here, mate. Um, Woodward, who joined the United in 2005 and became the vice chairman in 2012, I'm extremely proud to serve United and it has been an honour to work with the world's greatest football club for the past 16 years. The club is well positioned for the future. It'll be, diff diff it'll be difficult to walk away at the end of the year. No, it won't be. We'll, we'll, we'll take you wherever you want to go, mate. I will treasure the memories from the time at Man United. Uh, during a period when we won the Europa League, the FA Cup, the NFL Cup, and proud <coughs> of the regeneration of the club's culture, and I'll re return to the United way of playing. What are you talking bullshit? You know what's really interesting? Having thought about this, maybe Edward was only the only reason why Edward decided to basically bring in a director of football, which isn't really a director of football, just gave gave this guy that was already at the club a name change and brought in Darren Fletcher, who has no experience at all in the role that he's doing. You know, absolute bullshit jobs. Um, all things considered, might be because he knew he was leaving anyway. 
right? So this whole entire time, Edward has been at United, one of the kind of rallying calls from fans who've basically hated him, myself included, has been fair enough if you're going to be there. You're the accountant who's good with money and good with finances and you've been able to exponentially grow United's revenue, stream incomes, all this malarkey, which I don't really believe too tough. But hey, let's say he is a genius with numbers get someone else in that can handle the football side of things so that means getting a director of football but he was resistant to this from the onset we kept like you know we kept hearing about us getting a DOF for years planning looking shortlist interviewing people and it never happened until now and now coincidentally he's also leaving just off the back of that announcement so it then goes to show that he was never going to hire one if he was going to stay long term because he wanted to retain the power, even though he doesn't know what he's doing. Complete failure of a person. We have invested more than one billion in the squad during a time here, poorly, of course. And I'm particularly delighted with the progress the players have made under the astute leadership of Oligon Solskjaer and his coaching team in the last two years. Fuck off, they've not won anything. I'm sure that with the changes we've had um, or made on the field, the coaching and the staff in recent years, the great club will soon be lifting silver again. It deserves to. You don't deserve to be anywhere near it. I desperately wanted the club to win the Premier League during my tenure and I'm certain the foundations are in place to win it back for my passionate fans. Back for our passionate fans. Sorry, continues. Our world-famous academy is flourishing again with 34 players progressing in the first team um, since since 2013 it's been a pleasure to watch talents such as Marcus Rashford Greenwood Swansea be flourished in the first team environment in recent years to come what is that in recent years to come the club's production line of young talent will continue to push and establish first team players for their places that competition bodes well for the future we have also established many United Women's and the progress in the future further evidence of the demand and success of this great game yeah. absolute bottle jobs and Joe Glazer gave him a thing um, Wood Neville said he knew his time was going to be up so yeah I, I'm just shocked man I really am shocked to see Edward would finally leave I'm happy I'm over the moon it's such a weird kind of odd kind of result and consequence of this backlash and this protest from the ESL and I'm really pr proud to say that you know some of the moaning online has kind of affected some level of change and now United have the possibility of maybe returning back to where we were prior because we might be under some leadership that actually knows what they're, the fuck they're actually doing. You know, we might be in that position, might potentially, fingers crossed, who knows, who bloody knows. What else we got on this list? Oh, Apple spring loaded event the other day. Did you see that? That looked pretty cool, isn't it? This is from The Verge, um, Apple spring loaded event, the eight biggest announcements at the Apple spring loaded event. The first thing, of course, first things first to get out of the way is the new iMac. Beautiful, right? Beautiful designed product, absolutely gorgeous. Um, definitely kind of rings true to some of the, you know, classic iMacs from back in the day with the brain and the different sort of colored shells. The only thing I don't like about it, if I'm just being from an aesthetic point of view, is this unnecessary white frame around the screen and this chin. I don't understand why it just couldn't all be one color right the same color this i don't understand that i think even on the phones maybe the phones is different i think the phones yeah mine is red right so on the phones it's definitely got like a red tint all over it and i think the front no the front's black actually don't get me wrong but still they could have made it they could have done something to prevent it from having such a big chin i'm not too sure why it's got that massive section at the bit there maybe it's for you to stick your post-it notes on it i'm not too sure um the white frame again doesn't look that great kind of makes it look like a big ipad stuck on top of the imac but the design from the side like you know in terms of just you know industrial design and just the lines on it it's just gorgeous it looks like the screen is hovering right on that little joint there it's fucking fantastic it really does look special um how it sits is flipping beautiful obviously i maybe just go for the standard silver i think there's something quite cool about that it looks but this is anything i'm not really too fond of it's just a screen and the white frame around it with a little chin but overall it looks great and i even love the thing they've got about the plug i think they've got something about the plug let me see if i can get it up they've got this thing for the plug where if you stick an infinite cable in it you can stick an infinite cable into basically the club the the one of the cable hubs so it doesn't go through the back so you don't have mad wires coming out of it which is great to see um it's a really great way to kind of limit all the cables at the bottom let's see if i can get it up on here but yeah this imac looks flipping fantastic man it looks really 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 good let me see oh let's not get that on there it's gonna play the video on magic isn't it no nope, there we go where's it there we go new imac boom and let's get this over here if you can see that let's see if i can get that up on here 
Say hello to the new iMac. Whoops. Let's rewind that a bit now. Hello to the new iMac. You've say he say hello to the new iMac. You've never seen a computer like this before. Yeah, it's really that thin, but it's not magic. It's the M1 chip, which is kind of magic. Whoever designed that M1 chip as well, I hope they got a raise because they are milking the hell out of that M1. Don't 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 be surprised if you don't see that M1 chip in their Apple car soon. And it makes the new iMac fast, like your apps open instantly fast. Like, check that text while you clean your inbox while you share. Or maybe that's why. You know that little, hold on, you see that little movement? Because I said the chin's weird, right? Maybe that little movement the lady done in the documentary, I mean, in the advert, where it just sort of moves the screen. Maybe that's the reason why the chin's so big. So it allows you a little bit of space to move it, you know, at the angle that you want it to be at. Maybe, I'm not too sure, but still, it's unnecessary, really. And it doesn't need to be that big, right? It's super huge. Look at that. That's a huge chin at the bottom there. Fast. Like, your apps open instantly fast. Like, check that text while you clean your inbox while you share that photo while you stream that show fast that's fast it has a 4.5k retina display for colors that pop off the screen a 1080p camera oh, wow. so you'll look right in any light and what i wonder how much um covid had to do with this being pushed out now i wonder because the event you know i only learned about it a couple weeks ago I wonder if this kind of got rushed, not rushed, but you know, they kind of pushed the development of this further forward because a lot of people are spending more time at home, improving the front face camera, having it be very quick and multitasking and stuff, whatever it may be in case you, you know, you're, you're working with heavy or working with really big files. Maybe there is something in it or maybe because they see long term as well, there's going to be a definitely a change and shifting people deciding to work from home or work in the office. There's probably going to be a lot of people going to be splitting their time between those two locations. Maybe there's something in it. I think so. There may be something in that idea of just like, hey, let's kind of bring this iMac forward and kind of present it in a way that would make it desirable and maybe make it an option for people to buy now that they're going to be spending a lot more time at home and let's make it beautiful so people have something nice to look at because you know working from home can be a bit of a slog but if you've got something as beautiful as that to kind of stare at when you're doing your morning emails it does make things a little bit easier I'm not too sure who knows then you're talking to one person or a hundred the mics always focus on your voice so they hear you that's also awesome. what's around you Six speakers and Dolby Atmos means everything you do sounds great. Matching keyboard and mouse and wireless Touch ID. Boom, boom, boom. They have Touch ID on the keyboard, but not Touch ID on the phones. Does that mean they're going to return? They're going to bring back Touch ID? Because that's one of the things I'm kind of missing on my iPhone at the moment. It's great, don't get me wrong, but I'm not a fan of the Face ID thing. I'm never going to do something like that, even though I have, you know, I've registered myself on just about every single social media platform that exists <laughs> out there. I'm still kind of concerned about my online privacy. But the the kind of removal of the home button was a big blow, but I'm getting used to this new gesture at the moment now with the new phone. But not having the Touch ID it makes at paying contactless with your phone so annoying the whole double tapping and then putting in your pin code is just yuck just bring back touch, touch id make it a little bit easier to use because that's that was one of my godsend so see back on the keyboard is pretty cool and what happens on your iphone also happens on your imac that's definitely magic this is the new imac oh wait i forgot it comes in seven colors I like the colors too, don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of the colors. So yeah, new iMac out there. What else was on the list of stuff they had? Um, they also had um, the, 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 the unveils and AirTag item trackers, right? At long last, Apple took the wraps off its long rumored AirTag item trackers, which can track and find my, track them and find my app. You can customize your AirTag with an emoji too. You'll be able to pre-order them for $29 and they'll be available from the 30th of April. You can also get a four pack for $100. Pretty cool, isn't it? Um, funny story, I actually had a, a patent put out I think a while ago, I don't know where, it's probably still available now. I, I, I found a patent where I did like a similar sort of invention for kind of finding your phone. And I remember a manufacturer back in the day calling me about it. Like it was really a long, long time ago. I think I might have been 13 or 14 years old. I made like an invention basically for a little tag that you'd put on 
it's basically the idea i think around it was just basically to find your phone too the tag will be on your phone and then it'll be like a, i think i had it like a little key ring thing so stick on your phone and then you'd have another thing that you'd basically press and then that would alert you to where your phone was but then of course the the issue you'd run into is if that thing fell off your phone and then you pressed it you won't find your phone you just find wherever that thing happened to fall that's the issue so I'd, I'd be curious to see um how they kind of get around that with this but you know i'm sure there's some core cool technology linked to it actually let me just go in the video and see what they say about it i didn't actually see that bit of the of the show i saw everything else but i didn't see that let's go let's go, let's go back again keys <laughs> That's cool. <sighs> I've also found it interesting these Apple adverts. I'm sure there's different directors that do them and they're probably done out of how what was that? No, not done in house, I'd imagine. I'm, I'm sure they probably commission people to film these adverts but it's quite cool that they still manage to do them in a very apple way i wonder what that is about maybe it's because they give you like a um what's that thing called uh, a brand guide or something in terms of how you film it but they always feel very apple-ish even when they filmed i'm sure by loads of different people over the years they still have the same kind of feel about them it's a bit sanitized a little bit safe but it's definitely got a signature Whoa. pretty cool isn't it pretty pretty cool so yeah air tags as well featured in that and then what else did we have we had air tags um we had an apple tv 4k is getting an a12 bionic chip we had a redesigned apple tv remote and we had a f iphone coming in purple which is pretty cool and i think as well what the ipad pro right ipad pro with a thunderbolt cable which is flipping amazing which basically means they are slowly but surely getting laptops out of the way in it we're going to be in the future where laptops are basically going to be um you know the f thing of the past it looks like they're slowly but surely trying to get into that direction but that new iMac is special that new iMac is definitely something to behold um that definitely will kind of spruce up anyone's apartment going forward especially so yeah new stuff from Apple coming up very very soon if you have the funds go out there and get it if not just cry like everybody else <laughs> cry like everybody else what else do we have here what else do we have here oh yeah this is the important news of the day in it um george floyd derek chauvin has been found guilty 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 of murder um i'm not gonna be i'm gonna be honest i'm surprised i would just assume there would have just been a miscarrying of justice and he would have somehow managed to get away with it i was also kind of a bit worried when the charges came out as i thinking you know kind of proving without doubt that he chose to basically no proving without reasonable doubt prove, proving without reasonable doubt that he actually intended to end George Floyd's life was going to be very difficult when you consider how kind of dubious and reckless some of the police procedure police procedures are in terms of how they restrain people I just thought they were going to do something to try and wrangle him out of it right but in a real weird twist they've managed to kind of do the right thing and basically convict him for murdering him which he obviously did and in general hopefully kind of just stem the heat a little bit right it felt like um there was going to be a whole host of protests and riots and lootings going off the back of this if he was found not guilty for any of the counts so the fact that they were able just to kind of you know basically sacrifice him in order to kind of restore some level of normality and peace to america for a short period of time especially while stuff is reopening is definitely welcomed and i would imagine for the family too it's a great relief to get some level of closure i'm not quite sure how clo much closure you're actually going to get because you know you see your family member being murdered on tv again and again and again he's kind of deaf being spoken about you know in all corners of the world people are turning his death into an opportunity to grift money make 
to boost their own career it's just a bit gross to see all the stuff that's going on at the moment and i'm sure for the family to have some level of closure is definitely something that's going to be welcomed and the person that was directly responsible for his death is getting punished not like an institution or somebody else or him getting slapped on the wrist no the actual guy that did it that we all saw on camera is being convicted and i'm sure it would help them get some sort of level of resolution in that this is from bbc it says a US jury has found a, the former um, police officer guilty of murder over the death of the African-American George Floyd on a Minneapolis street last year. Derek Chauvin, 45, was filmed kneeling on George Floyd's neck more than nine minutes during the arrest in night last May. The widely watched video footage sparked worldwide protests against racism and excessive use of force by police. Chauvin was found guilty on three counts, second degree murder, third degree murder and manslaughter. His bail was immediately revoked and he was placed in custody. Sentencing is likely to happen in two months and Chauvin could spend decades in jail. So they're saying already 40 years, isn't it? Plus, right? In Minnesota, second degree murder carries a maximum sentence of 40 years. Third degree murder is 25 and second degree is 10. And the weird thing about America is that each charge has its own sentence, so it gets added on top of it. So if he gets those sentences, they'll be like, what? 75 years in prison, he'll basically end up getting, if, if according to what they have here. It's insane. So it continues. Um, Chauvin is expected to appeal against the verdict. Police officers have rarely been convicted, and if they are charged fully for deaths that occur in custody, and the verdict in this trial has been widely seen as indication that the US legal system will treat such cases in the future. Um, there are other officers due to face trial later this year on aiding and abetting the charges. And that is a really good point to make. This definitely does go this definitely does go a long way. It's obviously not gonna solve racism because that's never gonna end, unfortunately, in my opinion. I just think it's one of those unfortunate things we have to just live with and find a way to kind of prosper despite of. But what it does do is that it does send a warning message to police officers in the United States who by you know, fair enough, I don't really agree that they're all racist. I don't think that's definitely true. It's probably hard to even prove. But they're definitely incompetent. A large majority of these police officers are really, really bad at what they do. And if that's the case and some of their incompetency can lead to somebody passing away and losing their life or having a grave injury, they definitely need to be held account. And I think this sentence, what it does do is send a warning and say, hey, you can't get away with just being very shitty at your job. You have to be able to do your job to some level of competency in order to kind of look after your, you know, um, the people that you police in your neighborhood to some level that you're not uh, every interaction doesn't turn into a do or die because that's a thing that's been very perplexing too to see again from outside looking in why every interaction that happens within you know uh communities that are predominantly black and brown it ends so fatally it has to it, and it has to always end that way it can't end in a tussle it can't end in maybe getting shot in the leg it can't end in anything else it always has to end in death it's just so weird very very bizarre but hey what could we do? It continues. What was the reaction? The 12 member jury took less than a day to reach the verdict, which followed a highly charged three week trial that left Minneapolis on edge. Several hundred several hundred uh several hundred people cheered outside the court as the verdict was announced the family lawyer um, ben chump said it marked a turning point in u.s history so this is um some of the community talking about it too let's play a bit of the video murder while committing a felony find the defendant guilty <laughs> <laughs> day of april 2021 at 1 44 p.m signed juror four person Real tears, man. So we're glad oh. that we got the verdict. So that starts the process of the healing for some of our community. Yeah. It does not start the process of healing for all, but it starts the process of healing for some to where we can finally breathe just a little bit to know that we got at least somebody in our in our corner to say we're not gonna stand for this. So thank you for the justice, for the jurors, for the people that showed and stood there and recorded, for the people that got up there and said something and didn't just stand back and keep their mouths closed. Exactly. I did not expect this. I didn't think they was gonna do it. Mm. I, I, I did. I had no faith they was gonna do it. Mm. I did. I had faith. I'm glad they did. Thank you. I had faith. I'm just happy that this happened because I have two boys who are black and oh really this to happen, <laughs> i'm glad it happened unfortunately to someone else so that we can get the ball rolling to try to make some progress to do right because 
George Floyd is somebody's dad. He's somebody's son. He's somebody's uncle. It could have easily been my son. It could have easily been my dad. It could have easily been my brother. So I'm so happy that this is this tragic turn of events had to happen for it to for something to change. So it's so good to see all in all going forward. And again, um, it maybe does go to show that if as much as people complained about the looting and all the rioting and, you know, that wasn't obviously great. I think small businesses go up in flames. You can't really deny that some of that might have had a positive impact in allowing this verdict to come to pass. All that pressure from the community kicking doors and burning things and you know in some cases even murdering people right a couple of people died or maybe more than a couple of people died in the in the heat of all those protests we should be back we're back yeah we are okay cool we're back don't know why it's doing that for it's been annoying let's get this out of the way it's there it's working yep it's all working good okay so that's all dealt with um, going forward. What else do we have here? Da, 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 da. Yeah, we have this, um, another distressing news coming out for the States. Just, you know, they just don't stop in it. Like if there's one thing you can count on American police officers to do is to just use, you know, the <coughs> maximum level of force to render, maximum level of force in order to render help, wherever it may be, right? But also this situation kind of is a little bit complex um, and it's just tragic all around, all in shape or form, but it just doesn't end over there. It really doesn't. So this is courtesy of Sky News. Da, 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 da. Got it here. Yeah, there you go, it's there. Coach of Sky News says, Black girl shot dead by police minutes before Derek Chauvin verdicts are read. Absolutely tragic circumstance, isn't it, right? Um, it says, police have shot and killed a, a young black girl just before Derek Chauvin was convinced, convicted of murdering George Floyd. Sorry, shooting on Tuesday afternoon in Columbus, Ohio, came after police responded to reports of an attempted stabbing. The caller had said, fe said females were trying to stab them and put their hands on them according to columbus interim police chief michael woods no further details were gathered from the caller who rang up on the phone according to columbus, columbus dispatch it's unclear what then led the police to shooting the girl but she was taken to hospital where she was pronounced dead nobody else was injured Woods said this is a tragic incident for all involved but especially for the family of the female as i said earlier the bureau of criminal investigation conducting the criminal investigation to this incident at the conclusion of the investigation the division police will conduct an administrative review of the actions of the officer and all the officers at the scene franklin county uh children's services confirmed the teenager was micaiah bryant and she was a foster care according to the dispatch some reports said that she was 15 others said that she was 16 columbus mayor andrew ginter said that the police had body worn cameras at the time of the scene and we know based on the footage that the officer took action to protect another girl in our community but a family is grieving tonight and this 15 year old girl will never be coming home according to the associated press the footage shows the officer shooting micaiah as she appeared to attempt to stab two people with a knife key detail here a black handed a black handled blade resembling a kitchen knife or a steak knife appeared to be lying on the sidewalk next to her immediately after she was shot and fell the report later said the death came after the death came about 25 minutes before the judge in Minneapolis read uh, out a guilty verdict for the Derek Chauvin cases. Um, this related to the death of George Floyd. Again, I don't know why they're linking George Floyd to this, but, you know, what can we do? A black man who died in a, during an arrest in last May, Kimberly Shepard, 50, has lived in Columbus neighborhood for 17 years, and she said she knew the victim. She said to her neighbor, Jamie Jones, had celebrated a guilty verdict of Chauvin, but things changed very quickly. We were happy about the verdict, but you couldn't even enjoy that because as you were getting on the phone call that he was guilty, one i'm getting the next phone call that this is happening in my neighborhood now the actual video of the incident of course is graphic so if you're watching this via youtube make sure you just skip and do something else and then come back later but um the video does kind of exonerate the cop in some level because what it does go to show is that tragically what ended up happening if you read between the lines is that the girl that got shot was the one that was going to get rushed by a group of girls so she i don't know preemptively called the police kind of warning them that these girls are going to try and beat me up a group of them then somehow between the argument outside the aggressors who came to her house then called the police themselves and alleged that the girl had a knife which she did have to defend herself outside of her home and then in the process of fighting i guess or in a skirmish in the argument the police officers happened to get there just as they're about to start kicking off and then as they're kicking off and the the, the quote-unquote person that's about to get hit which is the makaya girl and she lunges towards the, one of the girls and pins her up against a car so giving her no option to kind of get out of the way 
the police officer kind of feels like he has no other option but to unload four bullets in her that's where i kind of get a bit dubious about hey isn't there any other way that you could um sort of uh what's that thing called restrain somebody with a knife apart from just shooting them center mess and kind of making sure that they are you know um taken off this earth isn't there a way that you can kind of resist them in some level of extent i'm not really sure but this is the video of the actual full encounter itself this poor fucking girl i'm not gonna put this shit on camera but he fucking shot this girl talking about she tried to stab him Breaking news in Ohio tonight where a Columbus police officer has shot and killed a 16-year-old foster child. Columbus police received a 911 call at 4.35 p.m. about an attempted stabbing at 3100 block of Legion Lane. The caller reported a female was trying to stab them, then the caller hung up. Officers responded to the scene, and at 4.45 p.m., that is when the officer involved shooting was reported. Moments after the shooting, family and neighbors gathered at the scene to find 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant dead after being shot four times by a Columbus police officer. The scene unfolded extremely quickly, and in less than 20 seconds of arriving on the scene, the officer fired the fatal shots. Here's that video right now, released by Columbus Police Department during a press conference. So the video is not that great of quality because it was a video of a video on a display at the police headquarters. And when you first watch this in real time, you don't actually even clock where the knife is. You don't even actually see that the girl's got a knife. So you have to kind of give, uh, well, you have to kind of tip your hat to the police for being able to kind of spot danger and kind of threats. Maybe that's something you learn in training, you know, to look for hands or whatever it may be. But I didn't even spot the knife the first, the first time around. You kind of have to get the video slowed down for you to actually spot where the knife was. But it's just such an unfortunate incident. Like the police just got there just as she was about to try and stab this girl. It looked like she was about to try and stab the girl. And then in that instant, unfortunately for her, she looked at the aggressor. And I guess the police had no other option but to shoot her because she was about to stab somebody else. So in an effort to save somebody's life, they had to kill somebody. Just so such a terrible thing all the way all all the way around there for everybody involved. Now that was quick and you probably didn't see it the first time, but here is it again in slow motion. They come out fighting I think that's a dad or somebody pushing over one of the girls. I guess that's in the group of the aggressor. She falls onto the floor. Right. She was fairly young to me as well. So, right, cool. All kind of youngish looking girls. And then as she's falling on the floor, the dad or the, the older guy that's in this home attempts to hit her while she's on the ground. The police officer pulls out his gun. He then attempts to kick her in the head, I think, right here. Look, there we go. He tries to kick her in the head. Then the Makai girl grabs the girl that's the aggressor, pins her up against towards a car, pulls out a knife, and is going to stab Makai attempting her, to stab yeah? the female yeah. on pink with a large knife, and that's when the officer opens fire, striking and killing Makai Bryant. <sighs> tragic, isn't it? Absolutely tragic, man. But four bullets, Columbus though. paramedics were cleared to come into the scene at 446, and the victim was transported in critical condition to Mount Carmel East Hospital, where she was pronounced dead at 521 p.m. Jesus Christ. The victim is 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant, who is currently in foster care by the Franklin County Children's Services. The Columbus Police Department released body cam footage late Tuesday night showing Bryant stabbing another person when the officer opened fire, fatally striking the teen. Again, tragic circumstances, but I just don't see how this has any relation to George Floyd whatsoever, apart from they share the same skin color. Um, again, it's just there needs to be a better conversation around conduct or uh, uh, there needs to be a conversation had especially with black people in america around how they kind of act around police officers because i just don't understand the logic around taking out a knife or getting into a physical altercation with cops around i just as always assumed whenever people say 5 or the feds are around or whatever it may be that you run right whenever there's an altercation you don't want to be caught having one in front of a cop because you might have to spend a night in jail and let's say you've got a knife that might then be a far more serious charge i would imagine the same thing would happen even if you're in a open carry state and you had a gun it would definitely be something that would be um uh it wouldn't be advantageous to your ability to stay alive if you pulled out a gun and try to defend yourself in front of cops too it just doesn't sound like the great thing to do in that regard and i just don't know what the right answer is to kind of sort this out and get this 
to be not be something that happens so often because again a 15 16 year old girl lost her life because she was trying to defend herself but then she was unlucky that at the time that she was trying to defend herself the police came and then again how are they meant to assess that situation she's just about to it looks like stab one of the girls in the abdomen which is going to be a fatal blow that's where all your vital organs are that's that's not something that's going to you know something that's going to be able to walk off that might be something that could result in that girl passing away um I would only argue that is it necessary for every sh every time a police officer pulls out their gun that it should result in somebody's death? Should it always be shoot to kill? That's the only thing that really I'm skeptical on. I'm not too sure about the laws in America. Maybe it's different. I don't really have a clue about it. But why is it always whenever they pull out their gun, they have to shoot to kill? Why can't they just maim you? Why can't they shoot you in the leg? Again, it's not guaranteed to shoot in the leg that you might not die still because it might hit an artery. But still, give me the opportunity to like, you know, limp for the rest of my life. Fair enough, but at least I'm alive or shoot me in the shoulder or something. It's always center of mass, right? And f I don't know, four bullets. Like, Jesus Christos, man. I get I get because someone's life was in danger. So it, clearly he's saving her life. And I've seen some people argue that if the aggressor was white and that girl was black and police did it, people would be happy or uh, whatever. Let's not get into like semantic race baiting, you know, skin color game things, whatever. It's tragic regardless. A young girl lost her life. But it's just... On one hand, it seems like the police are just too trigger happy. On the other side as well, there's definitely a conversation need to be had about how certain people within America decide to interact with police or decide to interact in general with other people when police are around. It just doesn't seem like the logical. Like it seemed to me, <clears throat> if you do get into an interaction or altercation with a police officer, you just should comply because they've got the law on their hands, on their side, and they've also got guns. They're always going to win. So you're always at a disadvantage. Why would you put yourself in that position? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, it's just so tragic. Again, a foster child, she's probably been through a hell of a life already. Maybe she's just gotten settled in in this new home. Who knows what her situation is. But to be in a position where now all of a sudden, off the back of, you know, just before the verdict has been called out for George Floyd, which has, again, nothing to do with this case whatsoever. And then your life is being taken away from you. And this tragic circumstance is just terrible. Terrible all around. But... Again, maybe maybe this is just a natural kind of consequence of just living in a society where you decide to give cops a carte blanche to just shoot at will. Do you know what I mean? Maybe this is just it. This is just kind of the unfortunate consequences of it. You might get a opportunity where they stop some terrorists in their track, but you also get as circumstances where they shoot unarmed fifteen year olds or sometimes armed fifteen year olds. Um but some people on Twitter at the moment are just going insane. They're trying to paint this out as if like she was just sitting on a park bench eating a sandwich and a piece of was shot in her head. Obviously she was kind of the you know, she was involved in a very heated argument that led to a physical altercation that she was willing to stab another teenager um in the body for. Do you know what I mean? Like this is not some play 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 thing. And to point it out as if she was literally braiding her hair at home and then a police officer jumped in through her window and strangled her to death is just really beyond the pale. But again, these people out there who are kind of grifting off the back of this and just using these altercations with police officers as an opportunity to kind of further drive the vision and kind of grift and pay their mortgage. I don't know how these people sleep at night, man. It's just deplorable and offering no solutions, really, offering no peace, just to continue turmoil that they kind of, you know, are feeding into, just continually stirring the pot. It's just horrendous. Don't get me wrong, this incident happened, fair enough, but the unnecessary narrative that's being painted at the moment, it's just weird. We all see the video. She clearly was being the aggressor in it, regardless of if she's the one that called the police. At this moment in time, the table had turned. She had gained the advantage. Her, f you know, the the whoever came to the house was on the floor, bats be kicked in the head by a dude. The other girl was pinned up against the side of a car, you know, with a girl that looked considerably bigger than her, about to lunge with a knife into her abdomen. That wasn't going to end well. So to paint it out as anything else is just really, really disrespectful in all things considered it's just is weird i just don't understand it but you know again i'm not over there maybe there's more fit more to it than meets the eye and if there is let me know in the comments down below and i'll get back to you what else is going on here 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 yeah this is one good news courtesy for us of all dance music fans boy shows says there'll be no need for lockdown restrictions from june 21st june 21st happens to be is going to be is on the cards to be one of the greatest days in club history it feels like clubbing history because that's when all the nightclubs are going to be allowed to be reopened there's going to be no um cap on capacity no need to wear a mask all that malarkey 
because I'm assuming by that time most people would have got the vaccine, especially people within my age range. So it's just going to be a free for all. It's going to be a free for all in there. People are going to be going absolutely insane. And I'm happy. I'm over the moon. I cannot wait. I really am over the moon. Cannot wait to be back into a club again. As great as it's been to go to places like Pirate Studios and record and mix and do all that good stuff. There is no um there is no substitute in being in a sweaty nightclub with you know sweaty dimly lit nightclub rubbing shoulders and swapping saliva and sweat with strangers nothing really comes close to it so to have the ability to do so and to also know that restrictions won't come in place after the fact is good because for sure it's going to be a bloody affair it's going to be bodies all over the place when people will step out of the clubs for the first time so this is the article says Boris Johnson is hosting a coronavirus news conference at Tindale Street today at the podium the UK Prime Minister said it is nothing in the scientific data currently to indicate the planned roadmap for reopening the economy ending lockdown restrictions will have to change he said I see nothing in the data now that makes me think that we're going to have to deviate in any way from the roadmap case cautious but irreversible that we have set out the roadmap announced in February plans for all social contacts restrictions to be lifted on June 21st meaning nightclubs and festivals can reopen while Johnson warned the scientists are firmly of the view that there will be another wave of COVID at some stage this year he said we cannot delude ourselves that COVID has gone away he added that the country must learn to live with it which I'm more than happy to do he announced plans to help defend against and cope with the virus including an anti-viral task force which is aimed to make the promising new medicines available later this year examples include pills that can be taken at home if you cannot if you contract covid or to reduce the likelihood of you becoming severely ill and a pill that could stop you becoming infected from the virus if you live with somebody who has tested positive absolute game changer to see the advances in science uh, maybe it's because we're just taking it for granted because of the age we live in and we have iphones and stuff so we just expect technological advances and brilliance and leaps in science to just occur but to see where we're at considering how un unsure everybody was about where this virus even originated from to suddenly now we're in a place where we have all these different you know approaches that we can kind of deal with when it comes to people contracting it it's just amazing to see it's just a shame that so many people had to lose their lives so soon on and they don't get to ben they don't get to benefit from any of this stuff so many people's families have been completely broken apart from this that's the only tragic bit of this we had to lose so many people at the start before we got a handle of it but it's also good to know that we're not going to lose as many people going forward anymore that's the only kind of silver lining i can really see from this it's still tragic when you think about the numbers it's just like wow insane um i think our germany and other places already passed 100,000 deaths it's just like fuck me man it continues dr nikita kania medical director of the primary care at nhs england also spoke at a news conference stating that the vaccination program is going from strength to strength she noted that the vaccination rates are raising among more uh, wary communities no, noting uptake is now four times higher in the pakistani communities and five times higher in the Bangladesh community which is definitely something i'm surprised on because there was a lot of um kind of uh, vaccine skepticism naturally um in the uk a lot of people that are kind of dubious about it i know a lot of young parents especially with kids with maybe learning difficulties or whatever it may be were not that keen on kind of you know running the gauntlet of being able to put their kid at risk but i've been kind of enamored to see people changing their minds so so and i think maybe most of it has to do with people's kind of um willingness and desire to get back to some level of normality people are so desperate for that that they're willing to basically take a risk um which again is you know commendable maybe it's a little bit worrying that people are willing to do that because you know their lives are so empty that they just need to get back to some level of normality to feel some level of wholeness but i guess overall for the covid vaccine rollout it's definitely a good thing it continues although lockdown looks to lift although lockdown looks set to lift as planned festival season could still be in doubt as industry body large-scale events will be forced to cancel without government backed insurance scheme and the events such as Shambhala and Boontown are already cancelling their 2021 edition this season yeah that's not that's a concern if I spoke about that already yesterday about Boontown I guess if you're the government you're probably not going to try and push forward any kind of like you know um 
what's the thing called approval of these insurance things whatever to insure people when they put on last grade events because it's just too risky you're gonna maybe let them take the hit this year and then maybe come back again next year of course it's a negative for the people putting them on but it makes sense considering how much money they've basically had to fork out in funding or whatever to kind of keep some of these establishments open and don't be shocked if we see a rise in taxes as well next year too to kind of account for all the furloughs and stuff because that's definitely going to be a bill we're going to have to pay but definitely um encouraging news for us in the uk cannot wait to get back to some semblance of normality when that reopens and then um, other news here it's a courtesy of mixed again it says scotland's music venues and festivals can reopen from the may 17th so sooner than us actually so it says the following scotland's music venues and festivals can reopen from may 17th music venues should be able to host crowds of 100 people with social distancing which is waste of time i'm actually happy we haven't done that I'm happy we haven't done the social distancing clubs thing we've kind of done no we've done it a little bit we have to do outdoor space in it but i'm happy we haven't done it indoors it's just like you know I, I, unless it's open as normal there's no point of keeping them open at all i guess it's bad for some clubs because i guess it wants some level of income but if you don't have the ability to social distance just stay just stay close until things can reopen properly and then you'll hope your community are going to come out you know spend the money and get on it um, the, the music venues will be able to host 100 people festivals will be able to host 500 cinemas theatres and comedy clubs will also be opening under the 100 capacity guidelines Scotland's roadmap <coughs> out of lockdown plans to allow 200 people for indoor venues and 1000 for outdoor venues by early June rising to 400 and 2000 by the end of June respectively NME reports that the latter may be negotiated to go higher the official guidance states from May 17th outdoor indoor events will be able to take place all conditions of supportive data in addition there will be a further work to develop and process the guidance for events and the proposed numbers specific restrictions or capabilities or sorry on capacities are to be discussed and agreed on in the meetings in the coming weeks in consultations with events industry so definitely good news on the british shores concerning um lockdown and concerning return to some semblance of normality with the nightclubs going forward i cannot wait i can not wait what else do we have here da, 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 da. see how much time we've used up don't want to waste too much of your time we continue on do, do, do. what else do we have yes yeah, move on from that no nope, we don't need this we don't need that oh yeah, this is cool isn't it yeah this is courtesy so courtesy of hypebeast this is good news isn't it um heron preston takes over as a creative consultant at calvin klein now i'm not sure if this means <coughs> he's a creative director if he's taking over the role from what raf simmons had or whether or not calvin klein have basically said hey we're not going to get any more you know big name design or big, we're not going to get people to come in and just you know uh take the reins of the brand for an indefinite amount of time we're going to set them and maybe uh a time scale from when they can come and design and have basically different people take over so it'll be you know let's say Virgil Abloh for Calvin Klein going forward right every there'll be guest designers coming and doing collection I'm not too sure but regardless it's definitely a win for a streetwear community overall to see somebody like Karen Preston gets such a prestigious job so this is definitely something cool to see and also a further vindication on that kind of Kanye West school of fashion design right the amount of people that have graduated to get big jobs that have kind of associated with Kanye and Yeezy and all that malarkey is just great isn't it like so many great people have come from that and been able to secure some high positions so this is definitely cool to see it says heron preston has picked up a new gig as a creative consultant for calvin klein the designer is expected to launch the spring summer 21 collection titled heron preston for calvin klein focusing on essentials including denim tees and underwear reimagined by preston the collection will be sustainably sourced as well as gender neutral jacob jordan calvin klein's global chief merchant um head of product strategy and new product ventures that's a hell of a title isn't it global chief merchant head of product strategy and new product ventures those jobs bruv um we have a uh, we have this idea of working with different visionary and creative people to help tell the calvin Klein story through a lens of their perspective on the experiences with the brand i see this project as a first step as reawakening for the brand moving us closer to our connection of the culture and creativity it's about forming interconnected partnerships who can help us tell a story in a way that maybe we couldn't on our own i don't know what that shit means but it sounds cool so from what it sounds like it does sound like they're going to get different people to take over and basically lead um the design for calvin for a bit which makes sense i was a fan of the raf simmons collection that he did for calvin but you know it wasn't very it wasn't kind of received greatly by the customer ironically it's another thing because i remember everyone kind of going you know people 
the fashion on Twitter is hor- horrible. People on there, it's like they hate everything. But ironically, if I remember correctly, um, Calvin Ralph Simmons for Calvin Klein was actually received pretty well by the fashion insiders but the people in the stops didn't care about it maybe because of distribution uh, they didn't get it out of the right places you know whatever it may be called pricing point i don't know but in terms of sales right i saw way more pieces from ref calvin klein in places like tk max and all those kind of places than i've ever seen in my entire life like huge sources of it were available people were picking up some absolute steals of that collection in mad places you would never expect so that definitely goes to show that some of these fashion stops you know they like stuff and then it doesn't sell and then the stuff that actually sells they have no appreciation for because it doesn't live up to their kind of lofty snobby standards <clears throat> but it's cool to see heron do his thing here it says earlier this week, Preston took to Instagram to showcase a billboard in New York City featuring a black and white portrait of the designer himself with the words, I'm working on it, written and next to him, which is great advertisement. He's always really good at that sort of activation anyway. The post on Instagram reveals that Creative had been secretly working with Calvin Klein for a year on this partnership. Harry Preston launches on uh, April 23rd and the global select markets in Asia and Europe. Fans can expect the prices of sweatshirts and hoodies to range between $138 to $298. Really great, really great pricing, isn't it? Um, and again i like the branding too the idea that he's got like that kind of you know the classic kind of signature hair and press and orange um incorporated with the calvin klein so it kind of stands out from afar and again it's just cool because i'm when i met this guy when i met this guy in like 2017 back in the day when i had my stop begging blog and he used to do his hair and preston blog thing that he used, had as well met him out in new york and he's just a really cool dude right just really chill level-headed and it's just a bit awesome to see people that you kind of known from the internet get all these amazing jobs it's just great to see them kind of you know chase their dreams and do these amazing things it definitely goes to show that if you just keep your head down and you work hard you definitely can get the rewards because if i remember correctly from back in the day I, hopefully he doesn't take this as an offense but he, he never really struck me as a fashion dude he wasn't you know he was obviously you know he wore clothes and shit but he never really struck me as somebody that was overly into fashion in that way shape or form maybe streetwear maybe merch later on down the line when he started doing a lot of the stuff with yeezy and the stuff of been true and all that other stuff that he was doing on his own but to see how he's kind of been able to take those kind of you know the education he has from you know doing what was it what he did in parsons some business strategy sort of thing whatever it was right just being about and being a culture connector and then kind of parlay that into the fashion thing is cool and i said from a long time ago that i actually think out of the entire group from that binge crew he's actually the best designer which is funny because he probably has the least amount of experience actually working in fashion in any way shape or form he's kind of come into it much later and again like i said aesthetic wise when i met him he never really struck me as a fashion guy but i actually think he's the the best out of the group out of him matt williams and virgil he's definitely i think the best and probably was it the best was he the best yeah i think he's the best personally i think he's the best i think he could probably do um yeah i think he's the best all round all round he's probably the best in my opinion of what he does i think he you know the improvements he's made of his own collection from season one to whatever season he's in at the moment is just exponential it's crazy to see and it's just cool that he's been able to give this opportunity and hopefully it's a long-term thing it's just a one-off and then um, they did this really cool video too that he uploaded on his uh instagram here a little interview segment here clip were talking about you know the inspiration around the whole thing itself and it looks really cool so let's play a bit of that as well to close out the shoe. Oh, for it. Calvin Klein chalk fire extinguisher. That's lit. Irony. That's so cool, isn't it? Imagine how cool that is. My very first memory of Calvin Klein? Obsession. My dad wore Obsession. I remember that bottle. I can almost remember the smell in a way, because he always wore it. This is our normal level test, test one, two, three. Thinking about this moment that we're in right now, looking at it as a reset in the world, a reset in fashion, and that, you know, where do we start? We start with the basics. Tea, socks, sweatpants. I wanted to have the very best offering of an essentials collection. Essential meaning no more, no less than what we truly need. That looks good. That's going to be very popular. We got to go harder on the details. So the quality of material, how the hand fills to the touch. It was about seams and finishing. 
sustainability is also really a big focus. How are the clothes going to be packaged? How can we replace plastic? So we started looking at paper. This is going to be for t-shirts, and this is for women's panties and bras. Carbon card archives, whoa, sick. How's it sectioned off? Is it ca is, are they in categories? It's by ear. When I got to go into the archives, it was just like all these iconic moments all within this roof. Calvin Klein was just such like a transformative brand. He made these pieces so tasteful. It was just so chic to wear like a white tee and like some denim. people are designing for can wear it like that's what i'm that really looks, that looks really, really cool, looking man. forward to is walking through the streets and you see people wearing it when you see how they have put it together in their own way man i'm so psyched <laughs> it's been a journey just to be a part of such an iconic brand and to make it within the history books dude like that's fucking huge that's fucking exciting that's that's just so sick. Heron Preston for Calvin Klein. So cool stuff, man. Definitely check it out if you're that way inclined. Definitely check it out if you're that way inclined. Anyway, that is the XO Zinga Show, episode number 451. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. You know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. And of course, if you're listening for the podcast app, a five-star review and a share will go a long way to help spread the show. And of course, bonus episode via Patreon is available at patreon.com. Fortress Agostino. Click on there for as little as $1, one pound per week or per month. Sorry, you get a subscription. <coughs> You get ability to go in my archive of bonus shows only available for Patreon subscribers. So make sure you get on there. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Peace.